Good evening, everybody. Welcome to another one of our, web our Wednesday night webinars. Um, and those of you who joined us last week, uh, I know, and there's a lot of you here who are joining us for part two, because last week we, of course, had Peter Carver doing his uh, very, very in-depth uh, explanation about how Leica M lenses are designed and, and built and the whole thought process behind that. And I know from comments uh, that we had in the chat that people just had no idea how much effort and detail and thought goes into such little tiny bits of beautiful glass. Today, or this evening I should say, we're going to be talking more about the SL lenses. This is the 50mm Summicron and when I first used this lens I remember being quite staggered at how the lens draws. It's got this most astonishing fall off of bokeh which is just beautiful. It's not a Noctilux, it's not meant to do that, it's an f2 lens but my goodness it's a beautiful lens. But anyway, um, Peter if you're there um, I can see your name on the the card. Hopefully your video will start this time. Are you able to join us there? There he is. Hello. Welcome again Peter. Good evening. It's a pleasure Good for evening. me to be here again. Yes, thanks. Good evening from quite a lot of people. We've got 60 people so far all joined in and probably expecting about 100 to be listening to you, which is a really good turnout. So uh, thank you so much for last week, because I know from the comments, as I said, there were some people were quite fascinated by the whole thing. So um, just whilst uh, I, I'm speaking, I suppose, I will do the same thing and I will vanish uh, myself so that I'm not distracting on the screen. You just focus your attention on Peter and what he's showing you. But if you want to ask questions, please do fire them at me in the chat or the q and I'll be seeing those come up on my screen and I will either defer those questions to the end or I will um, pop back up on the screen and ask Peter the question depending on what the topic is. So it worked well, quite, quite well last time. So we'll do that again. So Peter, welcome once more and please um, go ahead with your presentation about SL lenses. Today with Ms. my baby now about the SL system and the SL lenses. And before I start, I, I just want to highlight that we are talking about the CSC camera systems. The first CSC was the Leica 1 and then the Leica M is a classical or a traditional CSC camera. And today we talk about the SL as a mirrorless, easy to use, compact and <coughs> with interchangeable lens system we talk about with the L mount, of course. So <coughs> gene genealogy of Leica CSC is here, as you see, the M, the typical M type, then we have the CL and TL type with, with the L mount, and today we talk about <coughs> the SL and the SL2. Last time I explained the perceived performance, the proposal how to judge about optical systems, about, we talked about light flux, compactness, image performance, and ease of use and robustness. And today we will follow this concept again. And <clears throat> I hope you will understand, if you didn't join last time, I hope you will understand, even though I do not explain more in detail. Last time I talked about A-Sphere technology. We implemented <clears throat> first time 1964. And we continued in developing improved performance with A-spheres. And I also explained that we do polishing the A-spheres uh, and we try to avoid onion rings, the so-called onion rings to get best performance, not only in MTF, but also best performance regarding bokeh and uh, the, the defocus uh, impression. And so we implement uh, QED technology, so fine polishing, where we can reduce these onion rings, the typical uh, failure or typical structure you get when you do normal polishing the A-spheres. We, we do much more to get flat surface in terms of flat. I mean, the, the surface <laughs> is, is not disturbed by, by these onion rings. And last time I explained to you that generation three of the M lenses uh, within this graph, like the green type here, very high image performance, good light flux, robustness, but ease of use is so so because you, the, the photographer has to use his head to, to do all the things, the image, uh, the focusing, and of course we have auto exposure, but it's manually 
camera regarding focusing special. That's just a picture in between because we talk about photography and photography has to do with pictures and without showing pictures, it's boring, I think. <laughs> so. so the SL system is a modern professional camera and uh, the modern professional camera because of the 35 millimeter format, we have highest optical performance. Performance, we pushed the limits. Yes. And it's a camera easy to use. We have AAA, auto exposure, auto, <coughs> uh, auto white balance and, and auto ISO. Image stabilization is, is there and bright electronic viewfinder we have. Yes. <coughs> and last time I, I explained how, how Barnack and Barrick defines the design targets for the 35 millimeter first lenses. And they explained about the postcard, how they judged or how they counted the dots to define the design targets. And with APS system, when we introduced the APS system with a X camera, we did the same way. <coughs> like Barnack and, and <coughs> Beric did. We did, did we took, <coughs> we, we asked ourselves, or we wondered what will the customer expect, and we defined that the picture should have the same quality like 35 millimeter format pictures. And due to the fact that we have a crop factor of 1.5, the performance need to be better 1.5 times than the classical M lenses. And I explained already, we, we take into account 40 line pairs <coughs> with classical M lenses and internally we defined 60 line pairs need to be, uh, have uh, need to have a high, value and so we said internally 60 line pairs is our target and not 40 line pairs and with it because the end magnification should the APS system have the same performance like like the 35 millimeter format and we said 60 line pairs should have 50 percent contrast MTF and this target and it, it, we, we, we realized this performance with the uh, APS system and this target we took over for the SL system. So we pushed the limit again. We said we need to perform much better than the APS because of the larger format. And so we, we said, okay, we took over the targets from APS system and to keep the distance. And so internally we, we defined <coughs> 60 line pairs should have 50% contrast, 60 line pairs per millimeter to be uh, precise. Yes. So we pushed the limits. And let's talk about uh, one of the Zomilux uh, lens first, outstanding features, exceptional overall optical performance, the very fast lens, close focus uh, magnification is one by 10, optimized stray light reduction and so forth. Stepper motor inside, here is the in internal focusing group. This is required due to the <coughs> uh, autofocus system we use. Yes. And the relative size is 3.28. Optical performance is quite high. Here on axis, 80% for the 40 line pairs. We still publish 40 line pairs, but internally we say 60 line pairs need to have 50%. We don't want to confuse our customers in comparing 40 with 60 and so forth. So we stayed with a, the with a publishing 40 line pairs <coughs> as maximum frequency for MTF, but internally we, we define 50, uh, 60 line pairs. And here you see highest performance up to the edge. What you see here is chromatic color um, aberration, the chromatic distortion. In practice, uh, the, the MTF is better than, than we calculate. We calculate without image enhancement by software, but the distortion, color distortion, we compensate by software. So, and it's not only at infinity, it's also close focus. And you need to know that a, a fast lens can be optimized for one distance only. If you don't implement compensators to, to to <coughs> compensate us uh, for the variation of the aberrations, uh, differing from, um, how, how can I say, 
compensate the variation of the aberrations by focusing. And you, we, we implemented this focusing group so that the performance could, could uh, keep up <laughs> to the close focus because it's not only a focusing group, it's also a floating element, let's say, the function of a floating element to keep the performance high. <clears throat> but the, the main target today is to explain the SL primes, we, we call the, the, the summicron line. Uh, we want to explain the, the highest performance we implemented in this upper summicron <clears throat> line. And I want to talk about the image performance ready for the future, about the autofocus systems, system fast, precise, and quiet, about the value retention, robust and high durability, and of course, about the F number, why F2? And so we want to talk about the autofocus, image performance, and economic reliability. Let's start with autofocus. So as you know, we have a mirrorless system and we decided that we use contrast autofocus instead of face autofocus to, to control the focus. And co contrast autofocus means that you go through the focus in once and come, you will come back very fast to the best, to the peak contrast <coughs> uh, you want to have as, as, as focus point. And this needs to be very fast, only one loop, instead of, uh, uh, not, how, how is it called, uh, USM, the ultrasonic motors. We want to go through the focus and come back very fast. And for this, we implemented stepper motors. And to be precise, we said we want to have stepper motors, but the stepper motor requires a very light focusing lens element. And this, uh, the weight should be smaller than 20 grams. Here, for example, is a stepper motor. I go back again. Here you see how here's a, the linear guide <coughs> and here's the gear. And the precision of this stepper motor is quite high. The rotation is one rotation of the stepper motor is divided in 640 steps. One rotation is equal to 0.5 millimeter movement. And Six, uh, 0.5 millimeter divided by 640 steps means one step is 0.8 micron focusing accuracy. We can, can realize with that. So, um, and with this to, to realize a very fast autofocus from infinity to close focus, we said the movement should be not, not bigger than 10 millimeters. And to realize within 10 millimeters high performance, we decided to, to use a dual synchro drive concept. This means we have two lens elements which were controlled by these stepper motors independently and but synchronized. And this was a totally new optical design approach we, we targeted. Yes, absolutely new. And <coughs> New, new approach in the optical design, and we use linear guides to realize this, yes. And this is here, this is only the group, the focusing group, these two focusing groups with linear guides, three linear guides, and two motors, each motor for one focusing group, for the first one and for the second one. And I want to highlight at this point that <coughs> normally optics and mechanics <coughs> is uh, the trade-off, but today we have to follow what electronic <laughs> defines what we need to do. So electronic is a technology driver. They forced us to, to look for new optical design approaches, to, for not new solutions <laughs> to realize best performance in a compact size and with a very good autofocus system. Let's go to the highest image performance in a compact size. And the question always is today, the, the pixel rays, the, the megapixel rays still going on. And the question is how, how far can we go with our lenses? 
can our lenses keep up with the megapixel rays? And for this, I have a table here. 24 megapixel is the SL with six micron pixel pitch. So the size of the pixel and the Nyquist frequency is 83 line paths per millimeter. The 40 megapixel <coughs> sensor would have 4.7 micron, uh, micron uh, pixel pitch, pixel size, and the Nyquist frequency is 106. And the 60 line pairs would be, whenever it comes, I don't know, would have 3.8 microns and 132 line pairs per millimeter and so forth. And now the question is, how can, can our lenses keep up with this? Before I, I answer this question, I need to explain a little bit more what, what's about the Nyquist frequency. And so I took some slides from an older presentation we did in the past. And so let's have a look. This is a test chart image by the lens on the sensor. And this is the sensor. These are the pixel, the pixel widths here. And when you image this, this structure on the sensor, the sensor will see such a thing. The first pixel will see light only. The second pixel will be, will be lighted by this uh, part mostly, but there's a part of the back uh, structure <coughs> also imaged on that. The third is black, the fourth is gray again, <coughs> more gray than this, and, and so forth. And, <coughs> and the MTF of this structure, of this um, frequency, is, is nu1 here, would have this contrast, only due to the fact that we have an image on the sensor. And if we do the test chart as small as a pixel, it would look like that. But this is an ideal situation because normally this test chart will be shifted a little bit to the structure and then you will see nothing. And this is the Nyquist frequency we, de we define. Yes, this is a Nyquist frequency here. <laughs> How far can you go with the resolution? depends on the, on the pixel structure. And the so Nyquist frequency is defined by <coughs> one by two pixel size. Yes. So, and when we go to the test chart with a Nyquist frequency, with a frequency nu2, smaller than the pixel, then you will have an image like this. Yes, gray, dark gray, black, or dark black, dark gray, and so forth. And this looks like quite similar to that, what we have with the first uh, structure I showed. And so what happens, the wrong information is given by this sensor because the, <coughs> this frequency will be mirrored by the Nyquist frequency so, and looks like the first one. And this is subsampling, this is more ray as you know already, yes? But what I want, still want to explain again is Nyquist frequency because I explained uh, for each uh, resolution of the sensor, you have a special Nyquist frequency you have to take into account. So and in principle, the MTF of, of, an, of a sensor looks like this. So here is uh, the contrast in percentage and here is the frequency normalized to one. And if as, as small as the, freq uh, the, the, the object, <laughs> the frequency is, as lower as it will be the, the contrast. And here is, is uh, contrast equals zero. And the lenses <coughs> don't have, um, um, uh, how can I say, uh, diffraction limited optics. We don't have diffraction limited optics. Normally, this, this is a diffraction limited MTF. And this is uh, the, the normal MTF of a lens. And we say 50% contrast is sharp and crisp. And 10% contrast and lower is very barely recognizable. So you will not see. And we defined that <coughs> the, here should be the, the Nyquist frequency and here should be half of the Nyquist frequency. And then the balance between optics and sensors is on the ideal position. So the lens is, is not better than the sensor and the sensor is not better than the lens. So we have a best balance. And this definition, so we defined, we said half Nyquist frequency should have 50% contrast. 
So for 24 micro, uh, 24 megapixels, we should have 40 line pairs with 50% contrast. For 40 megapixels, we should have 50 and so forth. Please take into, please, uh, I would like to, to highlight, this is a rule of thumb. Yes. It's not an equation because you know that 132 divided by two is not 60, but it's just a rule of thumb. 24, 40 line pairs, 40 megapixel, 50 line pairs per millimeter, 60 megapixel, 60 line pairs, and so forth. Yeah. It's only a rule of thumb. <clears throat> and best balance between lens performance and sensor resolution is given if you have 50% <coughs> uh, uh, contrast for half Nyquist frequency. So, let us have a look at the, micros, uh, at the <coughs> performance of the 35 millimeter Zoomilux, uh, Zoomicron here on axis. Here is 24 megapixel Nyquist frequency. And, and here is for 48 megapixel Nyquist frequency. And so we see that the 35 millimeter <coughs> Zoomicron will have 50% contrast for 207 line pairs. This is far away from for 48 megapixel and so forth. So just to give a hint, we are prepared for the future, yes. But I will show later how far we can go. So and so let's, now I will, would, would like to explain the, the SL primes, the Aposumicron line more in detail. Let's start with the 90 millimeter high image performance at infinity and close focus. The contrast for eight, 40 line pairs per millimeter is over 80%, better than 80%. And close focus magnification is one by five, please. Now we have 11 lens elements, one A-sphere and double focusing internally, as I explained already. <coughs> yes. And the performance here for infinity is, is better on axis than 80%, here you see the 40 line pairs. And the fall off here is, is only the edge for one meter. In principle, you can say the close focus performance is still very high. The magnification one by five, we, we kept for, we have for all, all Zoomicron lenses for the upper Zoomicron. And the consequence is that you, the image, the smallest image you can take is equivalent to 12 centimeter by 18 centimeter in object, yes. So, so it's easy to, to detect what can I take, uh, how close can I go and how, how big is the magnification, yeah. One by four, it's, I think it's quite practical. <clears throat> so in here, here is for example, the one, one picture is, I took it with the SL2, F2, yes iso speed here and so forth. And you can go closer and see how, how, how shallow the depth of focus is, even though you have F2, yes. And in here you, you see the bokeh, yes. And I don't see a ring here, but this is a 90, yeah. Let's go forth. The 75 is quite similar to that, what we have with the 90. 11 lens elements, one A sphere, and high performance here again. Very high performance, magnification one by one at close focus. One by five, sorry. And here again, you can see highest performance. You can go closer and you see more. I showed a, a similar or picture with the M lenses. Yes. The 50 millimeter. <coughs> It's the same structure pr in principle, but we have three aspherical elements, one, two, three, with four aspherical surfaces. Yes. And again, the performance is quite high, not only at infinity, but also close focus. Yes. And here you see, uh, <laughs> and, and it's not a pizza, no? <laughs> and, uh, you can go closer and you see more. Yes. And then this is what I, what I think is very important. Use the image wide open. The three-dimensional impression you still have 
even though you go closer, this is, I took as a picture again with, with F2. Most pictures I do not stop down. And ISO speed 2000, but it's, it's quite amazing. The, the three dimensional impression you can realize with, you can feel. Close focus, proof of concept in close focus, again with F2. And here you see in macro, this is a macro picture in principle. It's only one by five, but, but you can go so close and the three dimensional impression you have is quite clear, I think. Here, this is a very fine line. <coughs> Spider, yes. The 35 is the best under the best, is the highest performance up to the edge, 90% contrast for sagittal and tangential, and also at close focus. And again, 13 lens elements, three aspherical lens elements, internal focusing, double focusing group. Yes. And we name all the lenses apochromatic correction. What does it mean, apochromatic correction? Why do we use this? So apochromatic correction means that the, that the color aberrations are very small. And by definition of Ernst Abbott from Zeiss in the past, he def defined apochromatic is when you have three focal points for three wavelengths, the same focal point. And here you see, this is this, uh, the, the focal point <coughs> For, for different wavelengths as indicated here from blue to, to, uh, to red. And here we have really apochromatic correction. And how can you prove this or how can you see this in the image? So we, this is a crop 100% of an image with which, uh, of a lens which is not apochromatic corrected. So you see intrafocal, you see reddish, and here in extrafocal you see greenish uh, highlights. And with the apochromatic correction, there is no, no change of the color <coughs> through focus. And this is color fringing or <coughs> there is, uh, will, will disappear absolutely. And without, with, without this color correction, you wouldn't get such a high M MTF performance. So it was needed to, to get highest performance for the 40 line pairs or respectively for the 60 line pairs internally, we, we needed to correct, uh, apochrom to do the apochromatic correction, implementing uh, special glass materials, apochromatic glass and so forth. Now I would like to, to make a <coughs> comparison. This is again the 35 millimeter, yeah, the Sumicron with highest uh, performance. Here's a frequency and here's a contrast on axis. <coughs> and I compare this with this Sumilux M, 35 millimeter ASPH. So now <coughs> we compare different F numbers. The reason why I do this uh, is that I would like to, to show you that even though we have F2, the impression in image is quite close to that what we deliver with, with uh, 1.4 FM. And here is the MTF curve for the, for, the, <coughs> for the 35 millimeter, which is a quite good lens in a compact size, and F number 1.4. And the 50% is at 40 line pairs, as I explained last time. 40 line pairs <coughs> has 50% uh, uh, contrast, contrast. So it fits, it fits well to, to the 24 megapixel sensor. And the reason why I compare this is that the impression is similar, even though we have F2 in comparison to F1.2, uh, 1.4. Here is a through focus behavior of the contrast. You focus through and then the contrast uh, increases here and falls off when you go through back in the back focus position for one image point. And the maximum contrast you, you realize for 40 line pairs is 50% contrast or 55%. The aposomicron this is, has a different through focus behavior because the, the contrast increases faster and more 
up to 90% and falls off faster. And so this means that 10% contrast or 20% contrast fall off will be recognized as unsharpness in the image. And, and the area within the depth of field, yes, is quite close to that what the 1.4 Zoomilux has. Similar contrast reduction by true focus is equivalent to that what similar depth of field impression means. And here is a image of the 35 millimeter aposomicron through focus. What you see here is no color aberrations. The color is a reddish. Here is a car. The car is a red car. Yes, it's not, not a color aberration. And the, the depth of focus is quite, very, quite small here. And intrafocal and extrafocal, the defocus is quite soft. And there are no, no disturbances by aberrations, no coma, no astigmatism, nothing at all. And so you, you see a really soft through focus impression. And the depth of focus is quite, quite very small. Let's have a look at an image again, 4000 ISO here, F2, 100, uh, 1 by 125 seconds exposure. <coughs> And you can go closer and the still the three-dimensional impression you have due to the fact that the contrast behavior is so, so high <coughs> on a high level, you get very best performance. Again, here, and this is not only for image performance regarding MDF, but also stray light reduction is done very well with this lens <coughs> or with all the aposomicron lenses. And you can go closer again and you see more. And the three-dimensional impression is still there. So <coughs> all explanation was done for the on-axis. Off-axis, the behavior is a little different. So there is, here is the image height from 0 to 21. And here's the contrast. <coughs> and here is, here is the frequency for 50% contrast uh, frequencies. So on axis, we have more than 200 <coughs> uh, lampers per millimeter at 50% contrast for the 35. And there is a behavior so that we have 74 line pairs with 50% contrast in the edge. So this means for 100 megapixel sensor, we will be prepared to crop as much as you want with 100 megapixel. As you can crop as much as you want, as, as long as you will not see pixels, there will be no aberration you, uh, you see from the sensor, uh, from, the, from the lens. So the lenses are prepared for more than 100 megapixels, even though you, uh, you will crop to the edge. Yes, please. So I have another question from Richard McKenzie. He would like to know, this is uh, timely, whether the design team looked to any lenses of the past when designing the SL lenses or whether these were entirely clean sheet designs. In principle, everything is an evolution from that what we have done before. <laughs> but but in, on the other side, this was a complete new co optical concept because of the focusing requirements uh, from the electronic side that we have double focusing and very light uh, focusing groups. And, and so we had to, we, we need to, needed to find a new concept, absolutely. So it's, it's done from scratch, totally new. With, but we didn't forget uh, to, to think through how good needs the lens, the A-spheres needs to be regarding the onion rings and all these things, yes. Okay, in, thank you. But completely new, so, so there is no comparison in the past. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. So now we talked about image performance in compact size, high, very high image performance, but now let's talk about economic reliability. Uh, how could we realize so high performance lenses for such a good price, let's say. <laughs> so normally highest optical performance means 
tight tolerances and what about the process stability and so not only the design target was not only to to get best performance but also to realize lenses which are possible to produce on the same level each part we deliver or each lens we deliver should have the same level as we guarantee for the m lenses we would like to guarantee is for the sl lenses too and so we did new uh, design a new design target was to desensitize the system this means to to make the tolerances more feasible in production <coughs> than we normally would expect with such a high level. And so we, we implemented new methods for simulation. We implemented virtual pro prototyping, yes, or digital twins we produced. And we, we did a lot in the production line. We had new computer-aided subgroup and final assembly, new measurement and adjustment methods and tools we implemented. We implemented lean production we implemented scalable processes and we have a platform concept. And now I would like to explain it more in detail. Yeah. So additional requirements, reduction of sensitivity or desensitization. Desensitization, sorry, <laughs> desensitization. So, <clears throat> so and, and I would like to explain it. You know the Aposomicron M, 50 millimeter, this is a very compact lens system, but with five lens groups only. So one, two, three, four, five groups. And here is the sensitivity for or the tolerance for each group regarding offset. How, how much offset is allowed for each parameter here, for each group? So for example, here we have 15 microns offset is allowed for the first group. This is good if you want to disassemble and assemble the first lens element, you can change it. These are tolerances we can, we can manage very good. Lens group number two has 10 microns uh, offset allowable. Lens number seven is critical, but we can manage it. It's, it's down to seven microns. Lens number nine, uh, group number, uh, sorry, these are the, the surface numbers. Group one, group two, group three, group four. The fourth group has a tolerance of, again, of 16 microns. And the last group here yeah, has only four microns. We can control this because this is a compact system. There is no, <coughs> so only minimum movement within inside. And, and we can manage it. Five groups is okay. Here we have much more groups. And so we said by ourselves to control this system, we can't accept so tight tolerances. So we needed to find solutions where we can live with, with better tolerances. And so we did. So here, as again, in comparison to that here, <coughs> the tolerance for the first group is more than 50 microns. For the second group here and so forth, only one group is number five. Uh, sorry, number, group number three is this one, two, three is this. It's a tight tolerance regarding 10. The, the focusing group itself has a tolerance, <coughs> the, the, the fourth group here, more than five, 50 microns. Yeah. And here, this, this group here is, is again, is uh, the focusing group. It's a very large tolerance and this was needed because there's movement inside and we have linear guides not not easy to control everything and and that's the reason why we said okay we need to find new solutions not only performance but in in theory performance in practice we want to realize and due to the fact that we have so many elements <coughs> and internal movements we said by ourselves we need to guarantee highest performance by reducing the requirements regarding tolerance. So, and why are we doing this? Because we have linear guides here internally, and this is totally different to that what we do normally with M lenses. M lenses are rotational symmetric, and we have machines with high preci precision milling and grinding and all these things, and <coughs> we can do it. But here is off-axis tolerances we need. 
And for this, we needed different uh, concepts. And to do this, we, have, we applied new assembly lines, new adjustments and check controls and digital documentation. This is a very, very modern production line we implemented. Yes. So each group, each subgroup of all lens systems of the upper Zoomicron line have a barcode, has a barcode. One group, one barcode. For each group, we have a barcode and this uh, subgroup is, will be controlled. And if the control is, is done well, you can go to the next step. If, it's, if the control says it's not okay, you can't follow the, the, <coughs> the, the production line with this group, you have to put it out of the, the line. And so we can guarantee each subgroup is, is okay and we assemble <coughs> from, from inside to outside all these lens groups. Yeah. So we have software and scanner supported assembly. So when you, when you go and we have different uh, setups here uh, <laughs> to adjust, to do sub adjustments and so forth. And why are we doing this? It's not possible to, ally, uh, to assemble a system and disassemble again, assemble and disassemble because of a lot of electronic is implemented as shown here. And electronic doesn't like to be disassembled and assembled again. And so we need needed to be sure that we have all groups under control. And if we do the final assembly, everything need to be okay without reassembling and so forth. So, <clears throat> but we couldn't do this for each lens system we planned individually. We said by ourselves, we need a platform concept to realize highest performance for a reasonable price. Because we can't install for each lens system a separate uh, lineup. Yes? And so, so we implemented a, a, a platform system. And that's the reason why we have this lens system from 90 millimeter to 21 will have each lens system will have the outer size the same. But it's not only outside the same, inside electronic parts are the same, the aperture group is the same, the motor and guidance and storage is the same and all these things. And the assembly concept is always the same. And due to the fact that we, have, we followed the platform concept, <coughs> the size is always the same. And that's a different to M. Here, are, here is the Summicron SL75 in comparison to the 90M, to the 75M, Summicron and so forth. And here you see the M lens is becoming smaller and smaller as small as the focal length is. And here's the minimum with 35 millimeter. But we kept the size for, the, for all these focal length lenses for the, for the SL system. And here is the reason why the, seven, the 35 is, has maximum performance within the best lens systems. Because we had a lot of space in comparison to that was a focal length delivers. Yeah? So 35, we wouldn't <coughs> need so, such a size for the lens system, but we could use this size to get best performance under the best comparison to that what what we are doing with M lenses. And just to, to prove the concept, here is the design. Here you see the frequencies on axis up to 140 line pairs. Yes. And this is the design here. And here are prototypes you see the measurement of the prototypes. And here you see we are very, very close to that what the what the what the design says. And this could be realized only because of the concept we followed, desensitization of the system. And here another example, MTF curve, here is on axis well, image eight zero and 21. And here's the MTF curve for 20 line pairs. <coughs> Red is design and blue is, uh, uh, is a prototyping. And here's indicated we focused on axis. And what you see here is a deviation from, from, 
from design. And now you see, oh, there's, there's a big de deviation, but the, the deviation is need to be explained a little more. When we focus off axis, the deviation is becoming smaller here, but the contrast will be going down here a little bit. This means we have a little curvature of field within the system. And if you focus off axis, the curvature of field will be compensated at that point. So you get the, the very high performance off axis. And there is no coma inside, no astigmatism, no decentration <coughs> failure and all these things. You wouldn't get such a performance. Yes. So and the variation of the curvature of field is due to the fact that the variation of the focal lengths of each lens part will vary a, bit, a little bit. And this will cause variation of the curvature of field. And so when we take into account <coughs> all these aspects and have a look at the perceived performance, and then we can say the light flux <coughs> for the Zoomilux 50 is very high, so we are here. The compactness is not that much because we, it, it, it's, it's not small, absolutely not. <laughs> but I will talk about the size later again. The image performance is high, ease of use is good, and robustness is there because we implemented the robustness we always you are uh, used to, uh, you will expect. Yes. <coughs> and the Sumicron, the light flux is eight, yes, because it's Sumicron, it's not Sumilux. The compactness is also eight. It's, it could be smaller, yes, but we decided not to do, but the image performance is 12, 120%. The ease of use is there because autofocus is there, everything's there, and the robustness is there because desensitization means not only in production, but also in, 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 uh, <coughs> in daily use, yes? Guarantee is that, the, that, the, that the performance will, be <coughs> will stay within the daily use. The question now is, 120% image performance, for what? For what do we need? Do we over-engineer this system? I don't think so. And that is the question. The question I'm at the end, at the beginning, I asked how far can we go with the pixel rays? And we showed that in principle, so the lens is prepared for more than 100 megapixel. If you don't crop in the edge, it's much more than 100 megapixel, yes? much more than 100 megapixels. But the question is for what? For that? Big pictures and go close? Yes, please. Okay, so we've had three or four questions. Um, yeah. what, people are very interested to know how the uh, CL and TL lenses uh, compare within their own design uh, to all the, the, um, the, the future proofing. Because I believe that they are, they are built, as you said earlier, to, to be measured at that 60 lines per millimeter setting. So does that mean there is similar optical quality in the context of the APS-C sensor size? In the context of the APS-C sensor size, yes. Yeah, yeah. So a, everything you're talking about, pretty much yeah, apply, apart from the modular system, does apply to the TL and CL lenses as well. Exactly. Um, Okay. This is a, the missing presentation between M and SL. There is a presentation about TL lenses, and they are they are made to be compact with high performance. Yes, but we don't go so far like we go with this. So 100 megapixel. I'm I'm not sure whether and and we didn't implement double focusing groups and so, such things. Yes. But in principle, these are the, the uh, APS system was the first step to go in that direction. Yes. When we implemented APS and we, we designed the lenses with 60 line pairs per millimeter, the reaction or the, the feedback from the customers fitted to that what we expected we want to deliver. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for my English. <laughs> I don't no, no, know no. can explain it in the right words. <laughs> Oh, so. you're doing great because the 35mm Sumilux TL is an astonishing lens, in my opinion. Yeah. 
and yeah. I know a lot of people just are amazed just how good it is. So yeah. um, it's, I'd, I've just been answering a few questions to some of our, our guests in the background and then because there was such sort of interest, maybe we could do the, uh, the TL Lens uh, webinar another time. That would be very interesting to all of our customers too. Anyway, you. I'll uh, let you get on. Okay, so the, the 35 and the, and the 60 is my preference for the TL and CL system. Okay, so for what are we doing this? And here we, we can go back to Banak. Banak said we want the snapshot camera. And with this system, we can define the snapshot situation a little new, in a new way. One shot, two pictures. I exaggerated fish eye and eagle eye. Of course, we don't have fish eye and eagle eye, but in that direction it, it goes. Concentration on this decisive moment. It's like middle format camera use. When you take a middle format camera, you always know that you crop later and do a final image uh, tuning you are doing later. And digital zoom without losses. Yes, not only at uh, <coughs> mobile phone, but in, in our system it's possible and more flexibility. And some some uh, examples I would like to show. This I have done with, with Aposumicon 35. And here you can crop in, in three three different pictures. Only only one one shot, but three different pictures you can make out of it. Yes. Or here <coughs> again three different pictures. And this is possible only if you have the resolution on sensor side and if the performance for the lens is there. If you have, if you have enough uh, uh, in the background, <laughs> you, can, you can use, yes. And here again, this I like very much because intrafocal and extrafocal, oh, I lost my mouse by here. <coughs> uh, the soft, transition from defocus, focus, defocus here, shows how good the performance is of the lens. There is no aberration inside. Absolutely no, no aberration. Not from design and not from production. Design is, is always easy to realize a system today without aberration, but you need to realize a system that is producible. And this was very a tough target for us. In stray light reduction, we have done quite well. <coughs> this is a picture I done without uh, without uh, lens hood, but lens hood doesn't work because the, the sunlight was here in this position. And when we go closer here, <coughs> I only crop the the, the JPEG, yeah, the JPEG. Yes, I don't use uh, DNG and do soft uh, uh, post processing or such things. Yeah. <coughs> Oops, I lost this here. Sorry. And here again, <coughs> and then proof of concept that there is no aberration inside. You will not see color aberrations here in such a situation. Normally, you see here reddish and, and here greenish or such, but you will not, it's, it's not there. Absolutely not. Apochromatic correction. So let's do a summary. We developed multi a sphere optics. Desensitization we did apply. We did light con weight construction to, to realize focusing movement in the fast time and highest performance in double focusing two electronic drives and we applied the platform concept. Yes. And we did a lot in the manufacturing assembly. Here is this. This is the assembly line, yes. It's a lean production, modern assembly line, software assisted assembly with a control here by the barcode. We used virtual prototypes <coughs> to, to prove at the beginning that we could realize a real good thing. And <coughs> subgroup testing, digital documentation and scalable processes. And this was necessary to realize such high performance lenses to a reasonable price. And now 
now let's talk about size, relative size. And it's the beginning from the first webinar I talked about relative size. Relative size is the total length of the system from first surface to image divided by the diagonal. And now you can, when you, we compare the Aposomicron M, this is the most compact M lens with high performance F2, and the relative size is 1.7. And the, <clears throat> but there is no autofocus, no autofocus. You have to use manually. And if you want to apply the same concept, high performance, but autofocus, we have to increase the size, relative size is 2.75. And if we compare now between APS, M, and SL, it's obvious. The Zoomilux 50 is the smallest version. The Zoomilux 35 for the TL, the APS system, is the second. And the third is the 51.4 for the SL system. But if you compare these lenses as relatives in relative size, the same effort we put into this lens like this in comparison to the size. So this is not big in relatively <laughs> to that what we have done with the 35 1.4. <laughs> Here you see the concept of Banach, smaller format, compactor system. <clears throat> and we do not compare here the, the, the same light flux. Yes? When we want to compare the same light flux, we have to compare these two lenses. F2, 50 millimeter aposomicron for the 35 millimeter format is equivalent to 1.4 35 APS uh, uh, for, the, <coughs> for the APS system. And here you see that relatively to the format, we reduce the size with this system in comparison to that what we have with the APS system. So the size of a system is always defined by the sensor format. And if you go smaller with the format, you can do smaller lenses, yes. But the effort you have to put into, in, with relation to the sensor of this light flux, you need to implement the relative size. And if you compare all, and here is the ranking, of course, the M is the smallest, best performance, yes. And the rest is, is close by. And again, last time I highlighted this F number is designed or the, 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 focal, the, the F number of each lens, the wide open F number is designed to be used. And if you stop down, you reduce the light flux. And if you stop down, you reduce the performance of the lens. For F number two is, is 100%. When you go to eight, you have 6% only you use from the performance. And if you compare systems, different systems from different vendors, please compare while open, mainly. <laughs> of course, you need to stop down if you need the depth of focus. But sometimes <coughs> it's a question stopping down or digital do zoom or smaller format. What is, what is most important? And that's the reason why I always highlight the light flux. Stopping down decreases the F, F number. Digital do zoom decreases the linear uh, decreases linear with sensor area. So the sensor area will be smaller. And digital zoom is equivalent to stopping down. Yes. And so if you always have a 35 millimeter format system and you always, if you have a 35 millimeter format system and you always stop down, you should ask yourself whether you shouldn't go to APS because smaller format is better in that case. Not only sometimes, it's better. And that's when I compare all these three systems, and this is a missing presentation, the M lenses are high performance, highest light flux, robust, and very compact, but not ease of use, but very, very compact. The SL lenses have highest, absolutely highest performance, ease of use, robust, but the compactness is not that what you expect from M, but not the same like M. And the TL system, the TL lenses are very compact. <coughs> the light flux is smaller because the, the sensor area is smaller, but the ease of use is. This tends to be a, a flying submarine thing regarding the requirements. If you want to have a, a 
convenient system. The API system is quite good for that. And the decision is yours. The classical M camera teaches you it's no out of focus and most challenging for you. You need to be to be willing to be teach by the M system. The APS format is a modern banner camera because smaller size and smaller format and all these things. And the SL system is a modern professional camera, full frame, out of focus, robust, but not small. Yes. And always the decision is yours. And my, ah, how can I say, my wish is use the lenses wide open as much as possible and then compare with other things and then you can make pictures never seen before perhaps or yes that's all thank you very much for for your attention thanks a lot thanks very much peter that's terrific thank you sure merci thank you brilliant now we've got quite a few questions <laughs> so if you've got a few minutes i'm going to see if i can get through all of them there's some here that, again, you may choose not to answer for obvious reasons, but let me just see what, what happens anyway. Um, starting at the top. So Mark Chan says, it seems like you have achieved ultimate performance. Can it be even further improved? What is next for Leica? So, I have some ideas, but I can't share this with you. <laughs> of course, okay. we are we are looking for smaller systems. So, so that it, so we're not we're not at the end of the road, are we? It's absolutely not. There is space, very very much space to to implement, and it depends Good. on that what the market is asking for. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, the talking about the uh, Vario lenses, how do the uh, Vario lenses compare in terms of lines per millimeter resolution with the Summicrons? Uh, the design targets were defined for, for all SL lenses. Yeah. Okay. So, so when you have a look at the MTF curves, you will see that it fits to the, uh, <coughs> to the zoom lenses too. Yes. But this is the reason why first we took so many lens elements within the system, the vario lenses. And why we said, okay, not a constant F number. <clears throat> yes. And because constant F number is an unnatural, is not a natural behavior of a zoom lens. As a natural behavior of a zoom lens is keeping the entrance pupil the same size. So, and then you can use all lens elements in the same manner, even though you have tailor or wide angle position. And so to get best performance on a reasonable size, not small, on a reasonable size, we said, okay, we want to have the highest performance on the one side, but with a, with a floating uh, F number, yes. Mm. Okay. Right, okay, so next question. Um, Mark Chan. Oh, yes, Mark Chan. Like a Q seems to have a, a dual range of focusing to include macro because there's that collar that you can turn. Is it possible for other lens systems to have that dual focusing range? In principle, yes. In pr so okay. We have external focusing group for mm -hmm. the Q. And with a, with a macro ring, we move the whole optical system <coughs> away from the, from, the, from the sensor. And then we change the focusing range from infinity to, uh, I don't know, to one, from one meter or what, uh, to one meter to, to 0 0.3 meter. I, I don't have the figures in mind, but it's quite close, yes. But with, okay. with moving the whole group, the whole system away from the from the sensor is going close focus. Yeah, because it, it seems would like possible, very, would be possible sorry. for others to yes. Yeah, it seems like a very elegant solution, but it's the only camera in the range that has that dual focusing. And in fact, that does lead to another question, which comes up a bit later: is Are there any plans for a macro lens in the SL range, like the seven sixty mil macro for the CL? 
Uh, we know that there are requirements <laughs> from market okay. side. <laughs> okay. Um, but on the other, right. but, but, uh, um, how can I say? When you go to the to the close focus position with the primes, and then you crop, you are very close to that what macro normally is doing. Yes. Okay. Uh, next one. Um, so again, about the Q2 lens, is that an SL or an M design inside? Well, it's, it's again a new and different concept because we had to implement an, uh, a central shutter. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It tends to be a compact camera lens, yes. And, and the rear, uh, the rear uh, lens element is very close to the sensor and it's different, yes. It's it's okay. more it's more a, a fixed uh, focal length system, compact camera system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does it does it? For, question from me. Does it make it easier to design a lens which is not interchangeable? Yeah. You. So, you can get a higher performance in a smaller size. Yes. Okay. It's for, for long, uh, for for wide angle lens element lens systems yes for telephoto not but for wide angle lens okay interesting i didn't know that um um, um, um does it say... oh <laughs> does the super in lenses like the upcoming super summicron sl 21 millimeter mean anything or just that it's super wide super wide yes super wide like the yes. super Elmar for the 18 and the M range, I would imagine. Super wide, yes. Okay. Um, and I don't know whether this is in fact true, um, but I, I know it's assumed by a lot of people, but the um, Stephen Ceruti would like, makes, the, makes the point, the SL2 and this, the Q2 can share, can share the same sensor. Any chance Peter could comment on the difference we will have between the 28 millimeter on the Q2 and the new, the upcoming 28 millimeter Summicron SL? In principle, the Q2 lens uh, has had the same design targets. Yes, so they are close close. I checked and they are close together as yes. quite quite similar. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we see a similar result. Okay. Yeah. Thanks then. Um, another one from Mark Chan. It seems customers are liking older lenses and Leica has recently recently announced the historical remake of the M50 f1.2. Okay, I didn't know that. Uh, why do you think customer? Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, why do you think customers like the look of older lenses? Um, can a similar lens be adapted? Can it be adapted to newer lenses, as in char oh, like character versus high performance? A little bit like the thumb bar, I suppose. So. I think there is there are many rumors about bokeh and who designing bokeh and all these things, yes. Um, most important is that the production has a certain level, quality level. And if you have a certain quality level, you can, you can produce good bokeh. Of course, aberration control in design has to do with bokeh too, but the differences are not that big between Z company and L company and all, <laughs> you name it, yes. But most important is the production. <laughs> yes. how, how good the production is, is perf uh, performing the, the centration, uh, the good centration of the lens elements and all these things. Yes. And so Tamba is a special lens because it's, it's going back in the past as like a time machine. <laughs> You can use the tamba. You put it out of the box, and it seems to be uh, done <laughs> in the past. And, and and you can reimagine how or how 
the past uh, was doing imaging yes and so it's it's like painting i think but if you that, that, that is the, the other direction this is more more art art direction i want to have a special feeling in the image a flare or, or aberrations and this is still valid yeah. On the other side, we are performance driven. Yes. For what do we need 48 megapixel if we don't look at the performance? Mm. Yes. And so this is the other aspect. And you can go closer and you can see more. And this is a this, uh, typical Leica uh, uh, <coughs> value, I would say. There's <coughs> The performance of the lens fits to the system. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Stephen Saruti also asks: um, Could you comment on the difference, the visual difference between the SL50 1.4 and the 50 Summicron? <clears throat> we talked today about the. Uh, the defocus or the, the contrast behavior close by the focus position. The, the sumilux <coughs> regarding the bokeh far away is much better, yes, because of the F number, yes. So what I talked about was the three-dimensional impression you get by, by going through focus and, and all these things. <coughs> and e e even though the, the, the sumilux M 1.435, I said the behavior, the close focus, uh, the through focus behavior is similar or, or quite close to the Summicron Apple. But <coughs> the bouquet, the size of the, of the unsharp spotlights and these things is defined by the F number and not by the uh, contrast behavior. So okay. <coughs> if you want to express more in your image, the unsharpness, or would you use as an image composition element that 1.4 is better? Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Uh, next question. Um, but, but I need to do some, some, some comparison pictures by myself. <laughs> yes, and I, I could do some for you actually, maybe. I've got both those lenses. Um, Stephen Valero also asking, um, when you're using the Leica L-Pro close-up lenses, will the TL or L-mount lenses maintain their 60 lines per millimeter target specification? Mm, no. On axis, yes, but off axis, not, no. On axis, yes, off axis, no, that's fair. Yeah, okay. Um, the, the change of the, of the distance is uh, too much to keep the performance there. Okay. So David Ching is asking about the 28 mil Summilux M. Um, I've made comments in the past, and that's obviously the newest lens. Um, I've made comments in the past that the that, that lens is astonishingly sharp in, in terms of acutance and edge sharpness, very much like the SL lenses. Um, David wants to ask you, he says he can't see that on the MTF charts for that lens, but it's something I've said anecdotally, and I wondered whether you had a comment on that. Yeah. Our, our MTF curves are uh, calculated, not measured. Mm -hmm. And if we measure MTF curves, we measure the system, uh, the, the, the lens without uh, the sensor. And oh. one, one thing is that we implement distortion compensation and color distortion compensation within the system. <coughs> not only at SL, but also for M. And that's the difference of the MTF curves we publish and that what the image delivers. That was a, what I explained already with the 50 millimeters Omilox SL. The MTF curves for 40 lambda is falling off very dramatically <coughs> off axis. And this is caused by the chromatic distortion. And chromatic distortion can be compensated by, by, by software very, very good. And so the different, we need to, to, to do some new MTF charts, I think, in the future. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, MTF charts definitely don't tell the full story, not by a long shot. Yeah, that's that's um, what I want to explain. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, um, yeah. Dan Shaw would like to know if there's a possibility for M and TL lenses to be weather sealed like the SL lenses are in future. It's always a definition is done by by the product management and if there is a requirement to do so we can do yes okay okay uh ludwig would like to know um oh no he's just making a comment thank you again for a most interesting session in answering some technical constraints of lenses and camera design it was the definition and tonal range of lenses in pre-digital days that moved me to Leica many decades ago. Ludwig, I know personally, he's got a, an astonishing collection of vintage lenses as well. So, uh, yes, he's a, a big, um, big fan. Um, is <laughs> no, nah, you won't be able to answer this one. Is the SL monochrome a possibility? <laughs> yes, it's a possibility. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> Will there be one? Who can say? <laughs> Arthur Macken, what kind of, sorry, please go on. Depends on uh, the market, whether there is a, a market for it. This year. Yes, 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 of course. Um, I'll leave that one. I'll answer that one myself. Um, Oh, yes, uh, Valeria Breveglieri is using the R series, the old Vince, the vintage R macro 100 f2.8 on the mm -hmm. SL2. Do you know how that might compare in performance to the Summicrons? And in general, um, R lenses, which have not been, oh, and in general, R lenses, uh, you know, do, they, do they stack up to the SL, um, in your opinion? Yes, yes, I think so. The upper uh, macro Elmerit is a quite good lens. It's below below the Summicron, but but you have a macro lens with that. So and and in macro you 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 are allowed to stop down, and then the performance yeah. comes very close to that. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, but but um, but in principle there are some some special R lenses I would uh, recommend to use. So for example the the Taylor Taylor Aposums, uh, the Taylor uh, yeah Aposum, uh, how is it called? Sorry, the seventy to one hundred and eighty, for example, the zoom the Apo, or or the four, the this is the Tilut two hundred and eighty f four the Apo, quite good lens, yes. Yeah, they are well, below that. What I explained uh, regarding the, the Sumicron line, Apo Sumicron line, but that's always a question: where's the balance? If you crop too much, or if you enlarge your image too much, you will see. Oh, here are some some uh, uh, some some weak points. <coughs> Depends. Stopping down, you can use, of course, and mm -hmm. and regarding performance. Uh, of the production, I'm sure you 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 are happy with that. <laughs> yes, uh, I I use the 180 uh, Elmerit R, the 2.8 version, not the not the Apo. I don't have that one, but the previous version. And I know that at f4, not 2.8, but f4, it's it's absolutely to the quality of the SL sensor because I use it all SL2 sensors, so I use it all the time. It's a fabulous lens. Okay, better move on. We don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, uh, Okay, Stephen Valera again. Uh, are the SL and CL cameras suitable for M lenses despite not having M sensors? <clears throat> best best camera for the M lenses is the M camera, but but <clears throat> uh, our SL and CL camera uh, fits to the M system. <clears throat> Because we have internally, we have some some uh, compensation of aberrations, and even though the, mm. the the filter thickness in front of the SL and uh, the CL is bigger than the M, I mm. think it's it's a second choice, much better than taking S camera, uh, the, not S uh, the S company, I would say. <laughs> 
the other companies have a big, big uh, packaging in front of the, the sensor and this damages the performance of the, the M lenses, yes, very much. Yeah. So yep. Yep. It's, second choice is good, it, it's, it performs good, but best is to use M lenses on M camera, yes. Okay. Um, I, I think I know the answer to this one. Are the TL lenses that are made in Japan inferior to the TL lenses that are made in Germany? Uh, the quality uh, targets and the uh, tests and acceptance conditions are the same. Yes. Okay, last three questions. Last three ones and then we'll, we'll call it an evening. Um, let me see. Uh, do I need... I'll answer that one myself in a minute. Um, how, oh, we've answered that one too. How does the Q2 lens uh, compare in design to the SL lens? I think we've already answered that one. And uh, Ted Grumbo, hi Ted. By the charts for SL lenses, the 50 mil F2. So, sorry, was, it's okay. I've got some gargled noise there. Um, that's okay. So um, by the charts for SL lenses, um, the 50 millimeter f2 outperforms the 50 millimeter f1.4. Is, is that in fact correct? Yes, yes. Yes. <laughs> but you don't get that bo same bokeh effect because of that fall off in the focus. So, so you have. Um, the bokeh effect is better with the Sumilux, yes. Regarding the overall performance, yeah. <coughs> the Sumicron is a little better, yes. And if you don't need the 1.4, she takes the Sumicron. That's, that's what I would say, <laughs> like to say. I, I that's this with, one here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's fabulous, <laughs> Glenn. All right, thank you for your very candid answer there. <laughs> all right, everybody's saying thank you very much. They really enjoyed it. I'm not sure everybody understood all of it because that was quite technical, but there will be a recording, of course, of this in a couple of weeks. I can't get it up live any sooner than that. So you can go back over all those charts and scratch your heads and understand what Peter was talking about in more detail. So once more for me, Peter, thank you so much for uh, sharing your time and your uh, your deep knowledge of lens design with us. And um, maybe in the future, we'll, we'll do the CLTL lens webinar as well, because obviously yeah. we've had quite a few people interested in that. Yeah. So uh, much appreciated, thanks. Thank you very much for, for your patience and for, your, <laughs> for uh, being part of the webinar. And thank you for your guidance through that. Nick, thank you very much. <laughs> My pleasure indeed. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, Peter. So I'll say good night to everybody. Um, next week is, a, is an online workshop, so there won't be a free webinar. And then the weekend, the week after that, so two weeks from today on the 30th, I believe that is, we've got a, a landscape photography webinar with Christian Fletcher over in West Australia, and he'll be talking about his SL2, and he uses the Vario lenses on the SL2. I don't think he's got any Summicrons, but I'm trying to talk him into that. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. We'll call it an evening and I will see many of you soon. Thanks very much. Bye for now.